So good morning. Uh, you know, I work for the Land Institute, which was founded 37 years ago by Wes Jackson, and I kind of laughed. Uh, I, as you could tell from my bio, come straight out of uh, what you would consider traditional industrial agriculture. I served on the Ag Committee while I was in the Kansas Legislature. I went on to be Ag Secretary in Kansas, which among other things is a great big mouthpiece for uh, the Ag industry in the state of Kansas, which is very large uh, uh, on its own. And then I went to work at the Environmental Protection Agency, and so it was funny. Uh, Wes Jackson and I have been friends for many years, and he was excited uh, to bring me on, but I kind of laughed and said, Wes, uh, you have been a part of this movement, or in some cases, you have founded this movement uh, long before I was ever born, and uh, most of the people that I know uh, are on your other list that you keep on the wall in your bathroom and throw darts at. Uh, but it's kind of fitting then that I get to deliver comments at this uh, organization and meeting because I think that in some cases where I might not be well suited at the Land Institute, this is a place where I probably have a little bit I can bring to the table. So I wanted to share this morning a little bit about something that we did while I was at EPA. Uh, and Region 7 includes all of Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. It is uh, very much the heartland and the most productive agricultural region in the country. But while I was there in August of 2011, uh, we signed a consent decree with the Metropolitan Sewage District uh, for the city of St. Louis. Uh, it was $4.7 billion spread over 23 years. At the time, it was the largest consent decree uh, for that sort of uh, system in the history of the United States. It was very exciting for us at Region 7, and we were very proud of that achievement. Now, some of you may be wondering, why is he talking about human excrement in a discussion of the Farm Bill? Uh, but I'll go, ahead and, I'll, I'll go ahead and tie those two things together. I, I share that story for two reasons. The first is, uh, when we talk about fundamental change in the ag landscape, uh, when, and we talk about other structures beyond the farm bill, uh, that Metropolitan Sewage District Consent Decree will have major implications for agriculture years down the line. because. We were only able to exact $4.7 billion out of the good citizens of St. Louis because they are what is considered a point source polluter. Uh, and under the Clean Water Act, that's very easy to regulate. And so uh, we could go in and say, you know, you need to clean things up and you're going to have to do it this way. And they had to agree to that. Uh, now, the non-point source polluters are not nearly as regulated under the Clean Water Act as point source polluters. But how long? Are the good citizens of St. Louis going to be happy about paying $4.7 billion over 23 years when they know full well that all of the non-point source polluters upstream of them are putting essentially the same nutrients into the water and they're not having to pay anything about it? In fact, on the flip side, in many cases they're getting paid by the federal government and they're putting those same nutrients into the water. So at some point in time, uh, our elective uh, representative government will begin to shift enough that the citizens of St. Louis and every other city that have had to pay large fines uh, on their water quality problems are going to begin to push those decisions and changes upstream onto the row crop landscape. That's, that's reason number one that I share that story. Reason number two is more a narrative as to why I left public service and went into the Land Institute. And it's because even though that was a big deal around the office, and truly it was a, a historic achievement to sign this consent decree, uh, I had to sit back and look at that and think, you know what? Here's $4.7 billion being spent by one city over the course of 23 years. So by the time this is finished, this was you know, three years ago, I'll be 54 years old. And the city of St. Louis is spending all of that money and all of this time just to get them to the absolute minimum level requirements of the Clean Water Act. Just to get them up to the standards set by that august institution we call the United States Congress. You know what? Even though that's important, and even though we need to get there, I want to do more than that certainly over 23 years, and certainly after $4.7 billion, 
I want to get to a place beyond the absolute minimal standards of meeting the Clean Water Act. We're not talking about St. Louis flushing out Dasani bottled water back into the Mississippi. They're going to be putting the absolute minimum requirements under the Clean Water Act back into the river. Now, I don't want to say that that's not important. And in fact, the Clean Water Act has already proven that it has dramatically improved things across the la landscape of this country. Uh, but I bring that up this morning because I want to talk about how in statistics uh, they have what is called the regression to the mean. Uh, it's basically that, I'm not a statistician, uh, but it's basically that you know eventually you move back to the average. And I think in policy work, and this was my experience after 10 years in policy work, I began to see what I call the problem of the ascension to the mean. That no matter how hard you work and no matter what sort of milestones you hit with policy, you're really just getting things up to average. Now average is good, and average is important for this country to move forward, and there's a place for that. But if these sorts of groups, if we're going to gather together and talk, we cannot be satisfied with ascending to the average if we're talking about soil conservation or animal welfare or pesticide application. We can't look back after 23 years and $4.7 billion and say, you know what, at least we got eight more inches on those gestation crates for those sows. We've come a long way in that time. We have to want more. And that's what I wanted when I ended up leaving public service, and that's why it's exciting for me to be at the Land Institute. If you're not familiar with the Land Institute, the place where I work now, it was founded 37 years ago with the idea that we can perennialize the major grain crops and grow them in mixtures. It's actually ironic that I left federal government, which I thought was moving slowly, and went to the Land Institute because the Land Institute is famously slow. We've been at this for 37 years, and we will continue to be at it for many more years after this. But it is exciting, even in the 10 months that I've been here, the milestones that happen on an annual basis. And it's also very fitting uh, that we're here in Minnesota because the Land Institute for the first time has 90 acres of our Kernza, which is our intermediate wheatgrass whose seed size we've doubled in the last seven years, growing here at the University of Minnesota. Not just for research in conjunction with the University of Minnesota, but also for grain. And the company Patagonia, which is more famous for its clothing, is getting into food, Patagonia provisions, and those 90 acres of Kernza will go to Patagonia at the end of this year, and they will turn it around and hopefully put something on the shelves that consumers can buy. An extraordinary milestone for the Land Institute, but also an extraordinary milestone for all of us that are trying to work outside of the realm of the Farm Bill. And so that's my final point this morning. As much as we want to kind of despair about this sort of ascension to the mean in policy work, to work in agriculture, in ag policy, it is very exciting because there are very few limits. We might think that the Farm Bill governs much of what we do, but I will tell you, uh, I spent in my years of policy uh, in two general areas, in agriculture and then in utilities uh, and, and ener on the energy side of policy. And between the two, there's no comparison which one is more heavily regulated. There is no group right now having a meeting called Beyond FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. You either work inside of FERC or you have some extraordinary idea that's so amazing that you can leapfrog beyond all of that. And very little of that happens. But in agriculture, consumers still get to make a choice. And farmers, for the most part, still get to make a choice. And as long as you have that environment, you can have and make extraordinary changes on the landscape and not be beholden to policies that eventually will leave you wanting more. That's what left me and why I left public policy and went to the Land Institute, and that's why even after 10 months, it has been the most fulfilling time that I have spent in my professional career. Because I can tell you, borrowing from the Old Testament prophets, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall remount up with wings as eagles. Yet they that wait upon the farm bill, well, they're still waiting. <laughs> Thank you.